Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the lives of Gordon and Carol Park from Cumbria in England. Carol Ann was born on the 18th of November 1945, and the following year was adopted by the Price family. The Prices already had a six-year-old son by the name of Ivor, and in 1951, six years after Carol's adoption, they had another child, a daughter who they named Christine. Carol grew up near Barrow in Cumbria and was an intelligent child with a gift for both languages and music. When she was around 18 years old, she met a man by the name of Gordon Park. Gordon was a year older than Carol, and the pair soon began dating. When Carol was at teacher training college, Gordon proposed, and they married a couple of years later on the 28th of August 1967. After their wedding, they moved to a house called Bluestones in a small village called Lees in Cumbria. They both worked as primary school teachers and were said to be very happy. They enjoyed an outdoors lifestyle with hobbies such as sailing and climbing, which was typical for the area. Carol's younger sister, Christine, was dating a man by the name of John Rapson, and on the 6th of March 1968, Christine gave birth to their daughter, who they named Vanessa. Just over a year later, on the 10th of April 1969, in a violent attack, John murdered Christine. She was just 17 years old. John was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Shortly afterwards, Gordon and Carol adopted baby Vanessa. The couple then went on to have two children of their own, Jeremy, who was born in March 1970, and Rachel, born in May 1971. In just two years, they went from a childless couple to being parents of three under four years old. This placed a strain on their relationship, and the marriage began to deteriorate. Carol left the family home on several occasions, but would always return after a short period of time, intending to make a go of their relationship. It was rumoured that the couple had an open marriage. In the summer of 1974, Carol met a man by the name of David Brearley. David had a young son called Michael, and had recently separated from his wife. Before long, David and Carol became romantically involved and Carol left Gordon in order to live with David. Carol adopted David's surname and the pair lived as a married couple. Gordon continued to take care of his and Carol's three children. He was angry with Carol for leaving and was completely against David being involved in his children's upbringing. By late 1974, Carol wanted a divorce and Gordon had started a new relationship. They went to court to try to establish the custody arrangements where Gordon lied under oath about his new relationship in the hope that this would not affect the custody decision. The split between Carol and Gordon became increasingly acrimonious. Meanwhile, Carol was becoming increasingly unhappy in her new living arrangements and being unable to live with her own children whilst the custody issue was being resolved. In the summer of 1975, when the children were returning from Carol to Gordon after a visit, she decided to go with them and never return to her new home. She never saw David again. Gordon and Carol worked hard to save their marriage, and it appeared that everything was back on track. By the summer of 1976, Carol had resumed working at a local primary school and seemed happy and content, looking forward to the summer break. It is understood that she was also making plans to trace her biological parents. At the beginning of the school summer holidays in 1976, the family had planned a day trip to Blackpool, about an hour and a half away from where they lived. However, on the morning of the 17th of July, Carol woke up feeling unwell and said that she wanted to stay at home. As the children, eight-year-old Vanessa, six-year-old Jeremy, and five-year-old Rachel were excited about the trip. Gordon still decided to go ahead as planned and took the children out for the day, allowing his wife to rest. That evening, when Gordon and the children returned home, Carol was nowhere to be seen. Initially believing that Carol had possibly just popped out somewhere, 
Gordon sorted the children's dinner and then put them to bed. However, Carol did not return. By late that night, Gordon started to think that Carol had left him once again. Her wedding ring had been left at the house and he thought, although wasn't sure, that some of her clothes had been taken. There was no sign of a struggle at the house and, whilst upset and annoyed, Gordon was not unduly concerned as this type of behaviour was not out of character for Carol, although in the past Gordon had always known where his wife had gone. The summer holidays continued and Gordon assumed that Carol would return in time to resume work at the beginning of the new school term. But when September arrived and Carol did not return, Gordon decided that he needed to report that his wife was missing. By this time, Carol had not been seen for over six weeks. The police launched a missing persons investigation but without any success. Carol had simply disappeared without a trace. The weeks turned into months and then years. Gordon continued to raise the three children without any contact or news about their mother. Gordon filed for divorce on the basis of Carol's desertion and this was finalised in August 1979. After an unsuccessful short second marriage in 1993, Gordon married a lady by the name of Jennifer, who he had known for his whole life. Four years after their marriage, in August 1997, Gordon and Jenny were enjoying a cycling holiday in France when, back in England, some amateur divers discovered an unusual package on an underwater ledge in Coniston Water in the Lake District. This was approximately 20 miles from where Gordon and Carol had lived in Lees. Believing that this package was part of a boat, the divers left it untouched. They returned three days later on the 13th of August 1997 to retrieve it. Upon closer inspection, they realised to their horror that the package they had found was actually a woman's body. She was wearing a nightdress, had been bound with rope wrapped in various plastic bags and a rucksack, then weighed down with lead pipes and rocks. The police were called and the body was identified as being Carol from her dental records. She had been just 31 years old at the time of her death. Carol had been thrown overboard from a boat and had landed on a ledge approximately 75 feet below the surface of the water. Had the boat moved a few metres further from the shore, her body would have likely sunk much deeper to the bottom of the lake, around 180 feet down, and would probably never have been discovered. 21 years after she disappeared from her home in Lees, Carol had finally been found. Due to the length of time which had passed, the post-mortem was difficult, but it was determined that Carol had died from severe injuries to her skull and face which had been caused by a blunt object which was not found. In France, Gordon was informed about the discovery of his first wife's body by his son, Jeremy, and also reportedly saw a news report of the police searching his home. Gordon arrived back in England on the 24th of August 1997 and the following morning was arrested on suspicion of murder. He denied any involvement in his wife's death. Gordon was charged with Carol's murder and remanded in custody at Preston Prison. He was granted bail on the 9th of September. The investigation continued but was hindered by the loss of the missing persons report from 1976. On the 6th of January 1998, the charges against Gordon were dropped. The Crown Prosecution Service released a statement saying that After a conference with leading counsel and the police, a decision was taken, in agreement with all parties, that there was insufficient evidence for a realistic prospect of conviction. Gordon continued to declare his innocence and said that he wanted to get on with his life and put these events behind him. He was paid by the Daily Mail for an interview, the proceeds from which he used to make repairs to his house and buy small gifts for his family members, including his children and wife, who believed in his innocence and had supported him throughout his ordeal. 
In addition, he purchased a new car to replace the one that had been seen in many of the news reports about the murder so that he could have some anonymity when driving. Carol's brother, Ivor Price, believed that Gordon had got away with murder and was disgusted by the way that Carol's character had come under attack during this time. A further six years passed and then, on the 13th of January 2004, the case made headlines once again. 28 years after Carol's disappearance, Gordon was arrested a second time and was again charged with her murder. With the discovery of new evidence, the case went to trial in late 2004 at Manchester Crown Court. The prosecution acknowledged that there wasn't one single piece of evidence that indisputably pointed to Gordon, but when all of the evidence came together, they believed that it could only point to Gordon being guilty. The prosecution case was based on a number of factors. One of their key pieces of evidence was the unusual knots which were used to tie Carol's body. It was stated that these same knots had been used in Gordon's house and boat. However, the defence argued that in an area where boating and climbing were extremely common hobbies, these could point to any number of people and not just Gordon. A witness, Joan Young, had come forward after Gordon's second arrest in 2004, stating that she had seen someone pushing something that could have been a body into the Coniston water back in 1976 from what Joan described as a cruiser yacht. However, the defence questioned the validity of her testimony due to the amount of time that had passed, her distance from the cruiser yacht making it near impossible to identify the person, and also stated that whilst Gordon did own a cruiser yacht in 1997, when Carol's body had been found, he had owned a racing dinghy in 1976 at the time of her disappearance. Another part of the prosecution's case was the testimony of two men, the first, Michael Wainwright, stated that Gordon had confessed to killing Carol when they shared a cell during Gordon's short prison stay in 1997. Michael claimed that Gordon had told him that he had returned home, gone upstairs and found his wife with another man and that he had killed her in anger because she deserved it. The defence however argued that Gordon had never met Michael, that his testimony was unreliable due to him being a heavy drug user and that it was clearly not true as he mentioned Gordon going upstairs even though the couple lived in a bungalow. Additionally, when forensic samples were taken from the house following the discovery of Carol's body, there was no evidence that a murder had ever taken place there. The second man, Glenn Banks, also testified that Gordon had told him that he had killed his wife. Glenn, who had learning difficulties, changed his story several times during interviews. At one point he claimed that Gordon, Carol and the children had sailed to Blackpool by sea and that Gordon had given his wife some white powder before she fell overboard. Glenn's story later changed to say that Gordon had killed his wife on a boat before placing her body in bags, weighing them down and throwing her overboard in a lake. Again, this testimony was painted by the defence as being completely unreliable due to the inconsistencies involved. The prosecution also presented the evidence of some slate which had been found in the same area of the lake where Carol's body had been found. They argued that this slate matched the rocks that had made up the wall of Gordon and Carol's bungalow. The defence however countered that this type of rock had been used in the area for hundreds of years and could have come from literally anywhere. The prosecution put forward the theory that, driven by jealousy, Gordon had drugged Carol, killed her and possibly stored her body in a chest freezer prior to dumping her in the lake. However, they did not provide any evidence to support the theory that her body may have been stored in a freezer. Three key witnesses presented by the defence remembered seeing Carol around the time of her disappearance. One remembered seeing Carol outside on her driveway on the day she disappeared. Another recalled seeing a man who drove a Volkswagen Beetle being at Carol's house for around 20 minutes on the day that she disappeared. This man has never been traced. 
The third witness remembered seeing Carol at the Charnock Richard service station on the M6 on the evening of her disappearance, 17th of July 1976. This particular encounter stuck in the witness's head as Carol had ignored her and the woman had subsequently told her husband about the encounter as she thought it strange. However, questions were raised as to whether this may have actually occurred on the 16th of July rather than the 17th, which would make this testimony irrelevant. The defence argued that it was most likely Carol's unidentified lover who had killed her. They also put forward the theory that Carol could have been murdered by John Rapson, the same man who had killed her sister seven years earlier. Despite receiving a life sentence for the murder in 1969, John was allowed weekend release from prison from March 1976 onwards. It was never established at the trial whether or not he was in the area at the time of Carol's disappearance. Gordon's trial lasted around 10 weeks and came to an end in January 2005. The jury deliberated for two days and on the 28th of January 2005 found Gordon guilty of Carroll's murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 15 years before he could be considered for parole. After the trial, Ivor Price, Carroll's brother, stated that he believed that justice had finally been done. However, many of Gordon's family, friends and neighbours believed the exact opposite. They were shocked by the conviction as they believed that the evidence against Gordon was circumstantial and could point to a whole number of people. They also believed that the sensationalist reporting by the press at the time gave the impression that Gordon was the only one who could have killed his wife. They had never seen Gordon act in a violent way and started vigils and petitions in an attempt to clear his name. Gordon's children appointed a new legal team to find grounds for an appeal and also set up a website to raise awareness and support. On 6th of December 2007, Gordon launched an appeal through his solicitors on the basis of new evidence which had not been available at the original trial. This included a signed statement from a witness who declared that the police had told them what to say in court. The solicitors also presented a geologist's evidence stating that the rock found near Carol's body was in no way specific to the house where Gordon and Carol had lived. After review of this evidence, Gordon's appeal was dismissed by three judges at the Court of Appeal in London in November 2008. The judges stated that the new evidence did not raise a reasonable doubt as to the safety of Gordon's conviction. Ivor Price, Carol's brother died not knowing the outcome of this appeal, but his daughters were said to be extremely grateful that the appeal had been dismissed and that justice for Carol had been maintained. However, Gordon's family and friends still remained convinced of his innocence. On the 25th of January 2010, Gordon's 66th birthday, he took his own life in his prison cell. He had never been considered a suicide risk. In November 2014, four years after Gordon's death, the Criminal Cases Review Commission began a review of Gordon's conviction based on new DNA evidence. It would take a further four years before the CCRC referred this to the Court of Appeal, believing that there was a real possibility that the court would quash Gordon's conviction in light of this new information. There were four main reasons for this. The first was evidence which undermined the prosecution's claim that Gordon used his mountain climbing axe to murder his wife. There was also evidence which further undermined the testimony of the prison witness. It was determined that the rock found in the lake near Carol's remains definitely could not be linked specifically to the rocks found at Gordon and Carol's house and, perhaps most significantly, that Gordon was not a contributor to the DNA found on the rope used to tie up Carol's body. The DNA was never identified. The final appeal began on the 5th of November 2019. Six months later, on the 1st of May 2020, this appeal was once again rejected. It is painfully clear how two families have been torn apart following Carol's disappearance, murder, 
and the subsequent legal proceedings. On one side are people who wholeheartedly believe that justice was eventually served whilst on the other there are those who believe that Gordon's incarceration and ultimately his death amount to a huge miscarriage of justice. From a legal standpoint the case has been fully resolved but for many doubt remains. As always I would be interested to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Please remember to hit like and subscribe. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. This case features in the book No Smoke by Sandra Lean. The book features seven cases that are examples of innocent people convicted of murder in the UK. Goodbye.